right, what's up, everybody? Hey, welcome to Liquid Church. I'm Pastor Tim, and uh, let's give a big old welcome to all our campuses and church online. Hey, guys, so glad you joined us for week two of our series, Dream Again. Um, last week, I asked a provocative question. I said, hey, what would you dare dream if you were absolutely convinced that God was with you? Like, 100%, you know in your heart of hearts he's with you. Like, he was with the biblical character named Joseph, Joseph the dreamer, and I heard uh, about many of the dreams that you guys have for 2021. Some people wrote me this week, they said, oh yeah, I have a dream of getting married, or starting a family, or maybe uh, getting your degree, or starting a business, or, or landing a job in your area of passion. And those are good dreams, very worthwhile pursuits, but many of you have God dreams, even loftier. You want to use your life to make a difference for others, uh, to maybe uh, help end human trafficking, or, or start a ministry for unwed moms, or or prisoners, uh, you know, who are, who are just released. You, I heard from some uh, teenagers who are launching a Bible study or prayer group at their school. Uh, or, or be an advocate for racial reconciliation. What you realize is you need God's help because it's a big dream you can't accomplish on your own. Or maybe even see accomplished in your lifetime. You know, on Monday we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And it's a federal holiday when we remember and celebrate the life and legacy of uh, the Baptist minister. Now, Dr. King, he's a preacher. He's probably most known for his famous I Have a Dream speech that he delivered from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in August 1963. And it really was Dr. King's sermon that helped galvanize the civil rights movement. It brought the, the play to the marginalized to an international audience. It still gives me chills whenever I listen to it. You know, Dr. King said he wasn't making a speech. He was, a, he was really a preacher. And he said, I, I have a dream that one day little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and, and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream, right? Dr. King's dream was fueled by a love that saw the best of what America could become. And although his dream right now, let's be honest, it seems far away from the heart of our nation, it is a reminder that there's work that remains to be done. I mean, understand, Dr. King's dream wasn't embraced by everybody in his lifetime, right? I mean, the fight for equality and justice, it was an uphill battle to build consensus, even within the household of faith. But Dr. King believed it was a God dream that was going to be built on the foundation of unity in the body of Christ. Amen? So in this moment of, like, kind of disunity in our nation, I love that Dr. King's dream is really left to us. It's left to you and me, the Church of Jesus Christ. To complete. Red, yellow, black, white, conservative, liberal, left, right, whatever. Dr. King said now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. Say amen if you agree. Dr. King had a God dream and God has one for you too. So today I want to talk about what it means to have a God dream for your life. And we're looking at the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis. So if you want to open your Bible uh, to Genesis or you can turn your mobile app. I'll put this up on our, our scripture on the screen. We're in Genesis 37. Um, if you recall, Joseph was just a teenager when God gave him a world-changing dream. Anybody remember how old Joseph was? Call it out. Type in the chat. How old? 17 years old. Just a teenager. And Joseph had a dream that really excited him, but it enraged his brothers. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain, and suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. Now, Joseph had no idea that God was writing a master plan for his life, that, that one day he actually would lead a nation, the nation of Egypt, through a severe famine. He'd actually save many other nations. But that's the first quality of a God dream. You guys remember this? I gave you a little acrostic there. I said a God dream has five qualities. Can you help me spell it? Give me a D. Give me an R. R. Give me a, what's next? <laughs> e, yeah, okay, I make sure I pass the English class here. E, A, give me an A. a. And do I have room for an a. M there? What's that spell? Dream. What's that spell? Dream. And what we learned is the first thing that a godly dream does is it directs your destiny. Everybody say destiny. It gives you a sense of purpose and direction in your life. God has a purpose and a plan for every one of your lives. And you know what? The Bible says he chose the exact year you were born. He chose the exact place where you live. It's not an accident. God has handcrafted you. Your, your, your gifts, your talents, your abilities, all of them were handcrafted for you to play a one-of-a-kind role 
in the salvation story that he's writing. Now, that may take some time to discover, right? I mean, Joseph was 17, and he didn't know everything that God's dream for his life would entail, which was probably a good thing, (laughs) because his brothers hated his guts for it. (laughs) Verse 8 says his brothers responded, oh, oh, so so you think you're going to be our king, do you? (laughs) Do you actually think that you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of what, church? Because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Joseph's brothers hated him for a lot of reasons. First off, he was daddy's favorite. They hated that. Secondly, his dream was offensive to them. Like, oh, oh, so we're going to bow down to you one day? And, and here's the thing. Joseph was immature. He was brash. He was naive about how they'd react. And the truth is, if God gives you a, a dream, you'll always have haters. Uh, people who I call dream killers. They have a dream. Their dream in life is to crap all over yours. <laughs> And it can even be your close friends or family, right, they, who love to, to criticize or say, oh, that's stupid, you can't do that, or, or you're too young, or you're too old. But you know what the Bible says in Acts? In the last days, God says, listen to this verse, I will pour out my spirit on all people, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see what? See visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Translation, you're never too old and never too young to dream of doing something great for God. Amen? You know, I spoke with a woman in her 50s last week who was touched by the message, but she said, you know, I kind of, she goes, Tim, I've got grown kids and they're moving out, and I, I kind of feel like maybe God's dream for my life is over. You know, her dream was being a mom, but she's like, I raised my kids and that was my purpose. And she said, sometimes I feel like maybe God's done with me. You know what I told her? I said, if you ain't dead, God ain't done. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it's the truth. God's dream for your life may be planted while you're young and fulfilled when you're old. And that's why it requires patience with the process. Everybody say patience. Joseph had a technicolor dream code. That's why I'm using these different colors. But it requires patience. Anybody else here hate to wait? It's not just being patient. It's being patient with God's process. In other words, there's a process to fulfilling a God-given dream. You know, We live in the age of Amazon, right? And and the reality is, it's all on God's timing. As as Americans, we want Amazon overnight, right? You guys know, you see something today, click, it's magically on your doorstep tomorrow. And that's the thing about a dream. You want it to happen overnight, but a God dream is handcrafted. It takes time. And so on the road to your dream, we said, you know what? God is going to test you in many ways. But listen to me, your biggest test is time. The time it takes. Joseph's dream was fulfilled 23 years later. From the original dream. And there was a long in-between season. I want you to remember that. Those of you who are maybe struggling right now. You don't see any progress. Or maybe you're tempted to quit and throw in the towel. And Joseph's life taught us that you know what? God dreams are conceived long before they're achieved. In other words, there's space between. Between the time God plants it in your heart. And the moment he brings it to pass. And you're living in the messy middle. And that's why you need to expect setbacks. Now this is an E that nobody likes to take and we're going to pick up right here. Expect setbacks. Nobody likes to have their agenda set back. They, we all want to move forward, but 2020 was a setback for sure. Amen? <laughs> Don't say amen to that. <laughs> when God gives a dream for your life, you have to understand something because as a believer, this is different than just like, oh, I have a goal to lose 20 pounds or something like that. When God gives a dream for your life, a God-saturated dream, guess what happens? The devil instantly opposes it. The devil or Satan, the Bible describes as the enemy of your soul. And he doesn't want you to make spiritual progress. So understand his mission is to steal, kill, and destroy God's dream for your life. And the devil attacked Jesus, and he'll attack you because you bear his image. So understand, he will tempt you, he will discourage you, try to get you to throw in the towel and quit. I want you to watch what happens to Joseph. It says, his brothers hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. And so they come up with a plot to kill the dream. They're out in the field together one day. And look at verse 18. It says this. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. And as he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Turn to your neighbor and say, here comes the dreamer. Type in the chat. Here comes the dreamer. Verse 20. Come on. Let's kill him. <laughs> Let's kill him. <laughs> you ever have sibling rivalry? Let's ki- I know what I'll do with him. Let's kill him. <laughs> And throw him in one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. And that's what his brothers do. 
They actually strip him of his robe. They throw him into a cistern. That's just a deep well or a pit. And then when some slave traders pass by, they actually sell Joseph as a slave and take him to Egypt. Did you read Joseph's story this week in your Bible? It, it's crazy. It's like an episode of 48 Hours. It's literally like murder for hire. Now, I want you to listen to this murder plot. Okay, listen to this. It says, then the brothers killed a young goat, and they dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with the message, look what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? And Joseph's father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Everybody say the word torn. Torn. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. My question is, what do you do when your dream is torn to pieces? You know, this week as I was praying, I just felt like God saying, you know, Tim, there's a lot of people in this church with shredded dreams. Shredded cheese, shredded dreams. Dreams that were ripped to pieces in 2020. And as I was meditating on this scripture to preach it to you, I, I, this verse in Genesis 37 jumped out at me. It was like, Joseph has clearly been what? Torn to pieces. And I asked God, what happens when your dream gets torn? When something precious is ripped from your life and literally dies in front of your eyes, can God restore it? Let me show you something cool. Um, I want to show you a painting. You art lovers are going to love this thing. This is a painting. Some of you know who it's by. Anybody know? This is a Picasso. This is a replica. <laughs> it's obviously not an original, but, but it's a Picasso, and it's me. It, the title of the painting is La Rêve in French. It translates The Dream. And The Dream is one of the most famous Picassos. It's an oil on canvas. You can see it's a, a young woman, and she's got her eyes closed, and she's looking up. She's got a smile. She looks like she's dreaming. And Picasso painted The Dream in 1932. And in 2001, an art collector named Steve Wynn bought this painting, The Dream, for $60 million, okay? Now, Steve Wynn is a billionaire, okay? He made his money, actually, on building uh, hotels and casinos in Las Vegas. You ever hear the Wynn Hotel and Casino? Have you been there? Okay, repent. <laughs> Wynn, <laughs> Wynn had, he had this emotional connection to The Dream because he, he, he thought of actually about naming his hotel The Dream after it. He thought, it represented my life. And so he paid $60 million to buy The Dream. Can you imagine... Spend $60 million on a painting? It, like, it seemed crazy at the time, until five years later. When another billionaire called him up, a billionaire named Steve Cohen, a hedge fund billionaire from New York City. That's right, the same Steve Cohen who just bought the New York Mets. He's a Picasso collector, too. So Cohen calls up Wynn, and he says, I want to buy the dream. And he offers him $139 million. I want you to think about that. In five years, the dream went from $60 million to $139 million. Not a bad markup, right? True story. You can look this up on the internet. This, is, this was 2006. But just before, Wynn loved the painting, but he agreed to sell it to Cohen. And before he did, he said, I just want to throw a farewell party for my, my family and friends to actually come see the dream one last time, you know, before it moves from Las Vegas to New York City. So, so this is what Wynn did. He actually set the painting on an easel in a private room in his Hallmark Casino. He invited his art collector friends, celebrities, to come see the dream up close in person one last time. And people flew in from all over the world, movie stars, celebrities. And at the reception, the unthinkable happened. Wynn got up to make a speech and propose a toast to the dream. And as he stood in front of the painting, he, he's a guy who kind of talks with his hands, maybe had a little bit too much to drink. He actually lost his mouth, fell backwards, and his elbow ripped right through the dream. Can you imagine? He actually tore a six-inch hole right through the middle of the dream. And yeah, people gasped. $139 million. The dream was torn. True story. Can you imagine the shock? The sadness, the grief. Something priceless, irreplaceable, ripped right in front of your eyes. And everyone thought the dream's destroyed. It's gone. This can never be restored. You know, it's probably how Joseph felt sitting in that pit. Betrayed by his brothers. Sold into slavery. His dad thought he was dead. Scripture says, Joseph has clearly been what? Torn to pieces. Maybe you feel that way today. You know, maybe in 2020... 
Something precious was torn from your life. Maybe a relationship was, was ripped apart. Or a dream job ended. Or, or, your, or your dream of going to college. Or, or your dream of getting married. Or starting a family. Or, or maybe it was to write a book or open a restaurant or a business. And, and, and the dream, the dream you had, it seems torn to pieces. Like, this can never be restored. I'll never get it back. Well, can I tell you? There's a second story to the Picasso painting. See, after Wynn tore the dream, he was upset. But it wasn't just the money. I mean, $139 million, but he's a billionaire. As an art collector, he's like a priceless piece of art, which is torn to pieces. And so they canceled the sale, obviously, but Wynn made plans to have it restored. He actually tracked down what's called an art surgeon. Went to Italy, found a master restorationist, who painstakingly studied the tear in the canvas under the microscope and began restoring the dream. Did, he didn't just touch up the paint. They actually found the Italian cotton that the canvas was woven from. Rewove the canvas, actually stitched together the, each fiber and repaired the damage. Perfectly matched the paint and lovingly restored the dream till it was good as new. Painstaking work. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Took them five years to do it. And when it was finished, art experts flew in again from all over the world to see the dream. And they couldn't tell with their naked eye where the damage had been. It was repaired so well that a few years later in 2013, Cohen came calling again. Mr. Cohen heard the dream had been restored and he said, I want to come see it. And he came and he, he looked at it and he had his art experts look at it and said, well, Mr. Wynn, I want to buy it again, but I ain't paying $139 million this time. I want to pay you $155 million, an absolute record for the most expensive art ever bought. He paid even more for it. Why? He said, because of what it's been through. This dream was torn to pieces but a master craftsman has expertly restored this, and now that's part of what makes it priceless, part of art history. What's my point? I came here to preach and tell somebody in 2021, God is going to restore your dream. Your, I'm just telling you, your setback is about to become God's setup for something even greater in your life. You understand? Your setback that you've had, it's not God setting you aside. It's not God setting you down. Your setback is God setting you up for his breakthrough. If Joseph hadn't been thrown in a pit, he never would have made it to the palace. And this is the year for your breakthrough to begin. Amen? God can redeem your dream. Say it with me. Redeem the dream. Tell your neighbor, redeem the dream. This is the year. No matter how messed up or beyond repair it seems, in fact, your dream is even more valuable to God because when people look at your life close up and actually see what you've gone through and what God's done to fix you, they can't believe what God's done by his mercy and power and grace. And it's what makes your life even more beautiful than before because of what it's endured. Your life is a priceless work of art to God. God can redeem your dream. If your dream is from God, that's what I'm telling you, you have to expect setbacks. Stuff will just happen that you can't control, you can't predict, or didn't deserve. Joseph didn't deserve to be betrayed, thrown into a pit, sold to slavery, but God used it to set him up and deliver him safely to Egypt. So if you're discouraged, I want you to take heart. Your setback may very well be God set up for a comeback. Because here's the truth. Satan has a plot for your life, but God has a plan. Satan has a plot, a scheme. It includes setback after setback after setback to discourage you. But God has a, a greater plan, wider and far-ranging than you can imagine. When Joseph arrived in Egypt, he actually went to work at the house of a guy named um, Potiphar. And the whole time, God's anointing never left him. Check this out. Genesis 39 says this. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was what was with Joseph. There's the God with me factor. Giving him success in everything he did. And this pleased Potiphar, and so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. In other words, this was Satan's second plot to derail Joseph's dream. First plot, human trafficking, sell him as a slave. Second plot, sexual harassment by Potiphar's wife. She, the, Potiphar's wife was the original desperate housewife. 
watch this. Watch this. Look at this verse. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. Muy guapo. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. This could have been a reality show, man. It's like Real Housewives of Egypt. Verse 8, it says, but Joseph, what he refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. And he's held nothing back from me except you because you're his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against Potiphar. It's not what he says. It would be a great sin against who? Against God. In every setback, Joseph never lost sight of God, never lost faith that God was with him, guiding him. And so he lived with 100% integrity. He refused to cave to temptation and anything that would derail his dream. The scripture says she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her and he kept out of her way as much as possible. Listen to me. Never let the enemy distract you or tempt you from God's dream for your life. Satan has a plot. He's going to try to trip you up, but God has a plan. And because Joseph didn't take the bait, he refused to sleep with Potiphar's wife. She was hurt. And so out of hatred, she accused him of attacking her. And Potiphar threw him into prison. Setback number three. It says, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was what? Was with him. He's with him in the pit. He's with him in prison. He showed Joseph what? Kindness. Remember it. And granted him what? Favor. In other words, Joseph lost his freedom, but he never lost his anointing. He never lost his integrity. And God used every setback in his life to forge a, a strength of conviction, of character inside of Joseph. You know how long Joseph spent in prison? Remember? Ten years. Over a decade behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. I mean, you talk about a dream that was shattered. His dream must have looked torn to shreds. But through it all, Joseph kept trusting his God because he knew his God had a plan. And guess what? God transformed his setback into a setup for Joseph's breakthrough, a breakthrough behind bars. It's, I don't have time. I'll just summarize. But in, in, in prison, Joseph meets two officials from Pharaoh's court, his baker and his cupbearer. They're, they're, they were basically Pharaoh's chef and taster. And they displeased Pharaoh, so he throws them in prison with Joseph. And one night, they each have a dream and they tell Joseph the dream. They said, we both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. And watch what Joseph says. Interpreting dreams is God's business. Go ahead and tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream first. He said, in my dream, I, I saw a grapevine in front of me. And, and the vine had three branches that began to bud and blossom. And soon it produced clusters of ripe grapes. I was holding Pharaoh's wine cup in my hand, and so I, I took a cluster of grapes and squeezed the juice into the cup, and then I, I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is what the dream means, Joseph said. The three branches represent three days. And within three days, Pharaoh's going to lift you up and restore you to your position as his chief cupbearer. Everybody say, restore you. I love this. In the middle of the darkest night of his setback, Joseph takes time to bless the dreams of others. That is the fourth quality of a God-given dream. A true God-given dream always blesses others. Turn to your neighbor and say, God bless you. Now say Gesundheit. It always blesses others. You see, a God dream isn't just a selfish dream. It can't just be about you. When I'm talking about dreaming, it's not like, I want to be an Instagram influencer who has millions of followers and makes tons of money. That ain't a God dream. That's a selfish fantasy. Joseph teaches us that a God-centered dream always makes room to make the dreams of others come true along the way. See, even in prison, Joseph isn't focused just on, on his dream. He helps the cupbearer's dream come true. In other words, he's committed to helping and blessing the people around him. And that's one of the hallmarks of a true God dream. Can I ask this question to you? Listen to me. I'm ask this. Is there room in your dream to bless others? Because that's what makes it a BHAG. Remember we talked about this? A big, holy, audacious goal. 
The reason it's a BHAG is because it's holy. It didn't just honor God, it blesses other people. You know, when we started this church 13 years ago, we had a big dream, BHAG. We said our big, holy, audacious goal, we're going we're gonna to saturate the state with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's been amazing, I'll tell you, it's just to see God realize his dream for our church in so many ways. But two years ago, I felt God kind of nudging me to help other churches. I actually was praying and I felt the Spirit saying to me, Tim, I want you to pour into other pastors. I want you to bless them the way I've blessed you. And so I said, I don't know how that's going to look, but I began thinking about it. And, 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 and I said, God, what do you want me to do? And what I did is I started tithing my time to help pastors of other churches, smaller churches around New Jersey, New York, Long Island, Connecticut, Pennsylvania. Every week I just started tithing my time, actually giving 10% of my leadership to serve other pastors. Just share some of the things God's taught us over the last decade. And so we started this pastor's coaching network. And, and over the last two years, take a look at this. We have now had over 55 senior pastors from around this region come to your church for coaching. We actually meet monthly. Now we're on Zoom. And what we do is we give away everything we have for free. We give them sermon series, kids curriculum. We give them free training and mentor them in best ministry practices. In other words, watch this. Part of Liquid's dream is to help other churches succeed. Amen? It can't just be our church is healthy. We want to bless uh, smaller churches, little churches, urban churches, ethnic churches. Because I'm like, God, expand my vision. If we're going to actually achieve the BHAG of saturating our state, New Jersey, as diverse and dense as that, it's going to take a lot more than Liquid. We need all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of people for Christ. Amen? So I want you to catch the heart behind that, guys. We can't just sit in a healthy, blessed church while our brothers and sisters struggle. we got to help them. And now their dreams are part of my dream as a lead pastor. I, I, I love, I feel privileged to pour into people like Ernest Grant. Ernest is awesome. He's actually lead pastor of Epiphany Church in Camden, New Jersey. He's a brother in Christ, and he's killing it in Camden. He's like, God called me the carjacking capital of the world. He said that to me. I was like, that's awesome, bro. I'll pour into that. He wants to saturate the city with the love of Jesus, and he's relaunching his urban congregation this spring. So I, I, I mentor and coach Ernest, and we jump on a Zoom call, and you know what I do? I listen, I listen to his dreams and help him achieve them. And I'm so proud of him, and I'm praying for them, and I hope you will too. But that's one of the marks of a God dream. Listen to me. Your fruit grows on other people's trees. You're not simply content with your own success. You just have this, this heart to bless others and see them succeed and pursue God's dream for their life. Amen? A God-given dream will always bless others. And so I'm just going to ask you one more time, is there room in your dream to bless others? Because you're blessed by God to be a blessing. See, even in prison, Joseph was a blessing to those around him. He eventually makes it out of prison. I'll end with this because you're wondering what the M is. All right now, all the OCD people, I want to complete my notes. What's the M? <laughs> a God-given dream. Boy, I'm going to have to get down here for this. Woo! Let's do it. Makes beauty. Everybody say beauty. Out of anybody? Ashes. You know where that verse is from? Everyone's like, the Bible? Yeah, the Bible. <laughs> beauty from ashes. Pharaoh has a strange dream, and uh, the cupbearer is, is like, um, yo, I know this dude in prison who's like mad good at interpreting dreams. <laughs> and so Pharaoh calls Joseph in to interpret his dream of seven skinny cows swallowing seven fat cows. And Joseph says, oh, yeah, a global famine is coming. And Pharaoh's like, what? Pharaoh can see that God's anointing, his hand is on Joseph. Look at this, verse 38. It says, so Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man? So obviously filled with the Spirit of God. Pharaoh doesn't even know God. He's like, the Holy Spirit's on this guy. Since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court, and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a higher rank than yours, Joseph. And Pharaoh said to him, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. So catch this. After being thrown into a pit, spending time in a prison, Joseph is elevated to the highest seat in the nation. And he puts together a kick-butt emergency relief plan for a global disaster. He orders the Egyptians to start storing up surplus grain in their, their storehouses for the coming famine. And when the famine hits, guess what? The Egyptians have surplus food to eat. 
In fact, they have so much that the surrounding nations, including Israel, hear all about it. And guess who comes calling for a handout? Who do you think? You know, full circle dream, Joseph's brothers. It says, since Joseph was governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. And when they arrived, let's read this out loud. Don't you love it when a dream comes true? Here we go. They bowed down before him with their faces to the ground. Isn't revenge a b -b -b blessing? <laughs> Can you imagine, man? Joseph is 40 years old. He's like sitting on a throne here in Egypt. He's got his like, you know, crunk up here and everything. And God's dream of a 17-year-old suddenly starts coming true before his eyes. And his brothers like bow down before him, faces to the ground. And you think, oh, sweet revenge. Here's my chance to get even. They don't recognize Joseph. He's Egyptian. Guy's wearing a gold gown. He's got black mascara on. And Joseph could have been like, surprise, suckers. You remember me? You made my life a living hell. And now I'm going to make yours. And he could have thrown them in prison or executed them on the spot. But he doesn't. Instead, instead, Joseph does something beautiful. Just like Jesus, he shows them grace. Not grace is. It's God's radical kindness and favor, just like God has shown him. Verse 15 says, but now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him, they said. But Joseph replied, look at this, this is beautiful. Don't, don't be afraid of me. Don't be afraid of me. He says, am I God that I can punish you? He's so humble, even though he's on a throne. And this is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. Let's say it together. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for all good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I'll continue to take care of you and your children. And so he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. Guys, this, this is, he touched you. It is such a beautiful picture of grace. Grace is the undeserved kindness in favor of God. It is blessing your enemy when they don't deserve it and they least expect it. Joseph could have crushed his brothers, paid them back right on the spot for the ugly thing they did. Sweet revenge. But instead, he says, I'm going to do something, oh, beautiful. I am going to pour out the loving kindness and favor of my heavenly father. Just the way he's lavished on me on my whole life. L look, look at how Joseph sees his setbacks. He says, you intended all of this for evil, but my God intended for what? Good, the saving of many lives. And then he says, don't be afraid. I'll take care of you. He reassures them by speaking kindly to them. In other words, he shows them blessing. He says, I'm going to break this cycle of family dysfunction. I'm going to take care of you and your children. And then he finally forgives them. After all he'd been through, Decades of pain and suffering and setbacks. And Joseph had a forgiving spirit. Listen carefully. This, this is for somebody here. Resentment is a dream killer. Resentment is a dream killer. I'm telling you, some of you are like, I want to get to my... If, if you have unforgiveness in your heart, you will never take hold of God's dream for your life. I'm just telling you. Maybe somebody hurt you bad or they made your life hell. And I'm just telling you, you keep holding on to that hurt in 2021, God can't elevate you. If you don't forgive them the way Christ forgave you, his anointing cannot flow through you. You see, God wants to bring beauty out of the ashes of your life. This, pray, this phrase actually comes from the prophet Isaiah. <laughs> Isaiah wrote this. He said, to all who mourn in Israel, God will give a crown of what? Beauty for ashes. There's an exchange. A joyous blessing instead of mourning. Festive praise instead of despair. I love that ashes, that image. So maybe some part of your life feels burned to the ground right now. And all you see are ashes. The ashes of your health. The ashes of a relationship. The ashes of a career. Listen to me. No matter how jacked up or torn to pieces it's been, God can not only redeem the dream, he can make beauty out of ashes. Blessing instead of mourning. Praise instead of despair. Let me share one final detail about this Picasso. I saved the best for last. See, after repairing the rip in the dream, Mr. Wynn told Mr. Cohen, he said, I know you still want to buy it for $139 million, but 
I need to warn you. I know the dream looks beautiful on the front. It's beautifully restored. But have you seen the back? And he turned it over and he showed him. And it was a mess. Because beneath the canvas, it was full of, of stitches and patches. And, and you could see all the damage that the art surgeon did. And he said, you still want to buy it? And that's when Con said, yeah, but I'm going to pay you $155 million for it. Because now that it's been restored by experts, this dream is even more valuable than before. Now there's a permanent reminder of all it's been through, and it's even more precious to me as an art collector. Guys, let me just tell you something. I stand up here every week, and you know what? Sometimes folks look at me or, or my family, and they think, well, it, you know, they got it all together. Because oh, all you see is this. Right on stage. Oh, you know, he's got a beautiful wife, beautiful kids. But the reality is, this is the Lucas family. I'm telling you, very few people see the other tie. I'm not kidding. You don't see the tears. You don't see the disappointments, the hurts, the struggles we've gone through. And you know what? That's okay. Because the devil has a plot, but my God's got a plan. You understand? You may, listen to me, you may have a mess right now, but God will turn it into a message, amen? Oh, you better give some praise to God for that. I'm preaching to somebody. You may go through a test, but God says, I'm going to turn that into a testimony. It was true for Joseph, it was true for Jesus, and it's true for you. Before Joseph went to the palace, guys, he was in a pit in a prison. You know what? Before Jesus was resurrected, your Savior endured a crucifixion. And when the disciples saw their Savior on that cross, his body ripped and beaten and broken and torn, they thought, the dream's over. There's no way back from this. But on the third day, on the third day, what did God do? He redeemed the dream, baby. And just like Joseph and just like Jesus, God can redeem your dream too. You got it. But here's the thing, guys. You got to put your dream in the nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ. Because then people can look at your life. You don't get all braggy and puffed up. And they'll look at you and they'll say, man, she's been touched by the hands of a master artist. And what the enemy intended for evil, her God intended for good. Amen? He's a God of grace. A God of second chances. And he's got a dream for your life. I'm just telling you, there's nothing too broken that Jesus can't fix. He'll bring beauty out of ashes. He promised it. He said to all who mourn, I'll give a crown of beauty for ashes. A joyous blessing instead of mourning. Festive praise instead of despair. Let's take a praise break. Would you give your God a praise, church? Because he's that good. Jesus is that powerful. And he's working. He's working right now. Even if you can't see it, he's working all things together for your good and his glory. Amen? It's 2021. Ask your God to redeem your dream. In fact, let's ask him to do that right now. Bow our heads. Let's pray together. Put your hands out. Lord Jesus, we just thank you. We praise you that you don't work in spite of our troubles. You work through them. And so I pray right now with everybody's hands uplifted, those at church online, I pray right now for every person here with a broken heart or a broken dream. In the midst of their weakness, would you now be strong on their behalf? Rise up within your people, Jesus. In your name, I ask that you would trade the ashes of our lives for the beauty of your presence. Trade their mourning for the oil of joy and gladness from your spirit. Trade our despair for hope and praise in 2021. Father, we know that you are with us in every trial we face, just like you were with Joseph. And Jesus, we believe you are greater. We thank you for the victory that's ours because of your cross and your empty tomb. And we believe you have something good prepared for our future. So we ask you now, work powerfully in our lives. We're opening our hands to open our church to you, our marriages to your blessing, our families, our ministries. Lord, trade our ashes for greater beauty this year. May 2021 be the year we dream again. Because, Jesus, we believe you're making all things new. It's in his name we pray. Everybody said together, amen. Church, give God a praise. He's a God who can redeem your dream. 
Thanks for watching the Liquid Church YouTube channel. Hey, don't stop here. I want to invite you to be part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this with a friend. You know, everybody's welcome to join us. If you were blessed by this message, you can support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. Thanks so much for watching. God bless.